Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is David Beard. I'm a product manager with the Vuforia platform. Um, we are an AR development platform. We provide an SDK and tools that enable you to create augmented reality experiences for really a range of objects and also environments. How many of you saw the keynote yesterday? OK, so you saw our demo. That's what these posters are derived from. So during today's session, we've gotten a lot of interest in how did we do this? How did we create not only the technology, but how did we design that experience? And what, in, what went into really informing the design and how, it was, how the logic was enabled? So my session today is about designing AR apps for real-world environments. That's, that's a mouthful. What I'm actually going to do, it, it's a bit um, of a misnomer, is I'm not going to actually go through how you would go and, and develop the experience that you saw on stage, because that's a one-off experience. It's something that we created. What I'm going to talk about are really what is a design strategy that you can use when approaching the creation of AR applications in dynamic environments. What are the considerations? What are the best practices? And how would you utilize an SDK like Vuforia in combination with technologies like Tango or HoloLens to create the kind of experience that you'd seen, right? What, what are the factors that go into that? So I'll talk about what, you know, really the state of AR today. What is it that Vuforia does? What has the AR community been doing, right? What kind of experiences have we been enabling? And then the future. And this is the near future. This is a future that is relying on technology that is entering the market currently. It's coming in the form of HoloLens, in the form of Tango, in other devices. So it's something that's really approachable for developers and designers at this time. And then I'll talk about strategy. Exactly how can you approach the development of an AR experience in a dynamic environment? Really the big consideration, um, which I think probably you realize, is when you hand an app off to a user and they take it into their home, or whatever setting, you don't control that any longer. You're, you're handing your app off to somebody else and you're asking them to execute an experience that you've conceived, but you have no idea how they're going to approach it, right? You have no real way to control exactly what they're going to do so you can influence them and you can inform them. And you can also design the app in a way that it's flexible and intelligent about what subject matter it's experiencing or what it's seeing, what the environment is, and what the, the contents, what it, what's in the environment, and how do you use that. So let me just show you what we've been doing. This is a reel that highlights some of the better apps that have been coming out over the past couple of years. What you're going to see here, these AR experiences are tied to objects. They tend to be something that's registered onto the surface of something else, or in the proximity of something else. And it's using images, like you've seen here, but also three-dimensional objects, right? But typically what it needs is some kind of apparent, something that is seen by the camera that our SDK can recognize. We know the position location of it, we know exactly where it is, but we really need that to anchor the experience. So this is what that looks like. Oh, hold on. Okay, so as I mentioned, a lot of it is, is focusing, the subject is some kind of an object, maybe it's a poster, maybe it's a, it's a toy, something like that. 
Uh, what's been happening over the past few years, really, is the development of AR around object recognition, image recognition, and tracking, um, and also the use of what it, it's been called a fiduciary marker, but some kind of a defined marker-like shape, right? Something that encodes information. What's nice is that even as we're evolving, these things are still significant for developing AR experiences. What's happening now is an evolution from using known objects into using known objects within constructed or reconstructed environments, right? And the second generation now is using a combination of what's known as depth sensing, which typically is an active IR sensor, something that actually emits IR, and then it's, what it's doing is it's looking at the IR pulse with a camera, and it's un it understands really by the phase or by the time of flight how far something is, and it constructs a map of the environment. So it's using depth, and then it's also combining that with um, what's referred to as visual inertial odometry. And what this gives you is the combination of a 3D map of the environment, typically as a mesh, and then also a knowledge of your position and movement within that environment. Depth handles reconstruction, it handles geometry, and visual inertial odometry handles movement and position. It gives you movement and position within a, a six degree of freedom envelope. So three degrees of freedom is your rotation, right? Six degrees of freedom is when you have rotation and you also have translation. So it has this ability to know where you're moving and also your orientation within that space. So this is very powerful. This is what gives you on the left Tango's ability to navigate within spaces and to have a sense of the contour and the area of the space. And HoloLens, which is focusing more so on what we call reconstruction, which is, again, deriving a geometry by creating a map of the environment. Um, both sets of technologies are capable of either use case, but they tend to focus on different. They're tuned for different capabilities. So the products in the market currently for this are the FAB, which we use during the demo. Um, also, Tango is supporting the Asus Zen phone. And Microsoft, obviously, is supporting HoloLens, right? Um, you're seeing HoloLens go into the Microsoft platform, so the APIs are becoming pervasive through the platform. But really, these are, these are I think, the best options currently for working with the combination of depth sensing and also positional tracking, right, for creating a, a dynamic AR experience. And again, the promise of this is that once you have that, where you have the traditional knowledge of a specific object that you're seeing, but now you can put that object into your environment, and you can know where it is, and then you can move around it, that's what enables you to create an experience where the user, without really restricting them or prescribing their activity, is enabled to move with, able to move within a space and to actually have an experience that evolves dynamically. That's the big thing. So the underlying technology for this um, really is a combination of, of cameras and what are called IMUs, inertial measurement units. You've heard of your gyro, your accelerometer within the phone. These are basically electromechanical devices, microelectromechanical devices that tell you uh, the vector of acceleration of something. Um, when you combine them, you have an ability to look at your environment and compare that with what's perceived as your movement of the environment. And with those comparisons, make an estimate of exactly how you're moving and where you're situated with regards to what the camera is seeing. So these devices are using a combination of um, really traditional RGB cameras, like device cameras that you've seen, like you've got on your phone. Also wide angle. On, what you'll see on them is a very wide angle lens. This is typically in black and white. The purpose of this in having a wider angle is that you have a very wide field of view and you can get lots of features in the environment. One of the critical things for any CV-based technique is that it, it's typically looking for um, what are called feature points, but this is you know, variations in the contrast of the surfaces you're looking at. It looks for fine changes in the contrast, and they tend to be unique for your perspective, and it tells you really, you know, what, what you're looking at as, as opposed to a new perspective. When you're looking, let's say, this fell in front of me, and I changed the perspective of Vinny, our new evangelist, that I can distinguish them because of the, the variance in contrast. The pattern of contrast is different. So there's typically optical cameras. The IR camera, again, is an active camera. There's actually a laser that pulses into the environment. And then there's another camera that's calibrated with that that looks for the laser point and understands really by either the phase of the pulse or the time of flight how far something is from you. And then the IMUs are fused with um, the optical camera. 
So there's a, there's a technique known as sensor fusion. It typically uses something like common filtering, and you're using the inertial change with the visual change, and you compare them, and it gives you a very good sense of where you're moving. It's like odometry. So with that being known, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges um, and also the opportunities. And I, I th one of the reasons I was excited to do this talk today is, um, as I said at the beginning, I don't have a way of telling you exactly how to do this, right? The point that we're at now with AR, really what we need is a discussion among people that are working with the fundamental technology, with the algorithms we use. But as significantly, or maybe more significantly, is talking about user experience and talking about strategies for designing applications. This is going to be something that evolves dramatically over the next few years. And a lot of the challenge, it's, we're, we're doing a good job on the underlying technology. It's really understanding the human factors and how do you design experiences that a user, naive to the technology, can execute effectively. This is really a UX challenge. Um, and a design challenge in the sense of understanding how to interpret the environment algorithmically in a way that you can inform the user and control the application so that the application executes successfully, or the experience, let me say, executes successfully. So let me show you one of the opportunities. This is what we had done the other day. You guys saw it at um, stage scale, right? This was using Tango. A neat aspect of this is you can create an experience that runs at stage scale. We could do it in this room. But you can also take it and then shrink it and run it at tabletop scale, right? So you can control that. The neat thing, like if you're, if you're distributing a game, you can't expect that someone is going to have a theater available to them. So you can take your game and you can reduce the size of the targets and they can, they can do it on their kitchen table or in their den. So that's interesting. You can actually scale an AR experience. What I'm going to show you is the same stage experience, but this is now designed for tabletops. So that kind of illustrates my point, is that we were able to create an application that, regardless of scale, could be executed successfully, right? And really in an arbitrary environment. And the way this was done, um, this was actually developed by Trigger Global, who deserves a huge amount of credit for the quality of the creative and, and just pulling this off, because this is a first of a kind. But what's driving that app largely is the fact that we're bringing in our traditional image targets, and we're using those to signal events and behaviors. That when you interact with one of these, you're putting the app into a new state. And it enables the user to control, not knowingly, but to control the state of the application for themselves. And what we're also doing, you'll notice as we got into later phases of this, that finding a given card, for example, was actually controlling the behavior of the Tango device. Let me see if I can find a good screen grab of this. Um, so we're not running Tango all the time. We're actually controlling the life cycle based on the state of the app, based on what the user is interacting with, right? This is significant, because any of the hardware um, 
running a laser, running IMUs, running the CV, is computationally intensive. It's going to eat resources. It's going to heat up your device. It's going to eat your battery. So you need to have an understanding of, of exactly what's being executed at the time so you can intelligently control this. This is a big factor in developing a successful AR experience because you, let's say someone's going for 10 minutes, they're playing a game, everything starts heating up, it starts down clocking, it's a bad experience, right? So the developer needs to be cognizant of that. Um, but really what's happening with the, the app that Trigger developed is they defined a sequence of targets, they assign behaviors to the targets, and then they basically assign phases of gameplay based on what the user was interacting with, right? So they start off, we preview everything, and the basic story of the game is that we're on Mars. This was actually inspired by some of JPL's work with the Mars journey, right? Um, there's a hazard, you've encountered a fissure, you use your drone to circumvent the hazard to find a path around it. So once you see that, and the drone is activated, we activate the depth sensor on the Tango. It scans the environment. And then the basic logic, and this is another significant thing I'm going to get into, is that using Vuforia, what we're able to do is take the feed from Tango, take the depth information, take the pose information. We actually parse that down and we kind of restructure it. Tango gives you a mesh. It's like you threw powder on things and then stitched it all together. You get a relief, effectively. There's not really any segmentation or knowledge of what the contents of what you're looking at are. So we take it, we parse it down, and we turn it into a set of useful objects that really represent planes in the environment. We know the size and the orientation. And the logic that Trigger was able to use here was to say, oh, okay, well, once the drone is scanning, have the drone look for a vertical surface and we're gonna call that a wall, and we'll pretend that there's ice in that. And that's where we execute this behavior where essentially once we find something vertical, we just nominate it as being the ice surface. The ice surface is then positioned against that wall, which is it's a, a PC wall. Um, and then the logic for the astronaut in navigating into this newly created environment is to go find the wall. And so we can tap against the surfaces to navigate her, and then once she's in proximity to the wall, we have a behavior that simply says, oh, when you're near the wall, you found it, and go ahead and then chip out ice, right? That's it. So that's a very, very simple example of creating something that can be executed dynamically, and the only real dependencies here are having a few things that you know about in the form of the targets and having a flat surface and a vertical surface, right? That's very simple. What you'd want to do in the future maybe is build out things that are more elaborate, but this gives you the building blocks. And what I'm going to get into now is really a couple of other use cases, but then talking about how having structure and a knowledge of the geometry and a knowledge of the semantic contents, the semantic information in the environment, how that's significant. And what it enables is not only for you to kind of understand boundaries and geometry, but to start reasoning about these. And this is really the, the revolution in this stuff, is that once you have a sense, when you have a structure, and let's say it's organized hierarchically, and you have semantic information, so you know you're looking at the teacup versus a target versus my laptop, that you can start inferencing. You can start making assumptions and chains of reasoning about your environment that will enable you to create sort of a logical um, scheme for approaching the design of your application. Again, trigger, thank you. Um, just general use cases. Gaming is obviously going to be popular. Another easy one for developers is, is shopping cases. This is things putting things into your environment. You have a new ottoman, you want to see what a coffee maker looks like, you want to see what your fridge will look like, or maybe even an extension to your house you want to put on a patio. You would use these technologies really to enable you to accurately register content in your environment. Right? That's a, a very attractive use case for a lot of developers and also for, for buyers of the technology. The third big area is really workplace, and this is broad. Um, but it's, it's the matter of, of everything from delivering instructions or remote assistance or blowing up things so that people can get a better view for a diagnostic case. Um, again, these can use things like targets. The nice thing when you're looking at the caterpillar there is we have a target in there that tells you exactly which cat tractor this is down to the, the ID number. And what that enables you to do is once you recognize it, you can bootstrap something like a HoloLens. That then gives you the geometry. We know where the target is within that so we can orient the user and we can execute an experience. So it's a great way of bootstrapping something for that. But let me just get into some of the principles around this. You know, this is my interpretation. It's not, you know, locked in stone. But the way that I look at really the challenge of developing AR applications, that it, it, it combines 
really four main areas, four main factors. This is user experience, right? What is the UX you're presenting to the user? How do you induce them to behave in a way that is going to enable them to accomplish an AR experience successfully, that's going to be entertaining and useful to them? The other big area is really workflows. And with traditional AR applications, workflow came in the sense of like, how do you prepare your model so you can introduce it in an AR app? How do you introduce data so it can be visualized in an AR app? And that's, it's something that was typically performed before the app was ever delivered to somebody. What's interesting about dynamic experience is that you're, as part of UX, you're expecting the user to perform some series of steps, typically to prepare their environment. If I'm saying to you, hey, would you like to play the Mars game? Okay, you need to take your cards and you need to lay out the Fisher card to start the game, right? There's a series of steps you're asking from them. So you're actually asking the user to perform some element of the workflow for you, right? The other big areas are, are the hardware and algorithms. The user isn't interacting with these so much. Um, but the way I recognize them really is the distinction between human factors, what are we acting, what is the human perceiving or what are we asking people to do, and machine factors which are embodied in the hardware and the algorithms that are, that are present in the device. So this sort of generally is a good way of just dividing the set of responsibilities and, and sort of tasks that you're looking at or challenges. The big one over traditional AR is now we're, we're more explicitly putting people into an environment. Now they have a setting, right? And the content isn't so much registered to something they know, so much as, a, so much as an area that they've created for themselves. So when you start thinking about settings, you do have to be more attuned to sort of the capabilities of the hardware and the sensing. An easy way of thinking about this, at least to my mind, um, is really in, in envelopes of performance, right? These are abstract, obviously. So, what you're looking at is really what is the illumination in the environment? So we have a tolerance, any of the sensors, with the, with the, whether it's the RGB sensor or the IR sensor, that it's good within a certain range of luminosity. If it's very dark, it's not gonna work because there's no apparent features, it can't see anything. If it's very bright, it's gonna blow things out, whether due to exposure compensation or IR saturation. So typically, just as a rule of thumb, uh, with something like depth sensing, is it's, it's good for indoor environments. It's good for some place with a diffused controlled lighting. You could do it outdoors as long as it's not super bright. Um, these environments are actually challenging because you've got a lot of bright spots. Um, but a way to think about illumination, or really any of these, is for a given sensor, whether it's a camera, an optical camera, or a depth sensor, is what are the apparent features? And for an optical camera, is it, these are really the things you can see. So we can't see well in a very bright environment or a very dark environment, neither can the camera. Um, with an IR camera, the, the IR camera can't see something that is necessarily extremely hot or that really doesn't have, or absorbs all IR. Like a very black surface is going to absorb IR, and so it'll lose it. The way that they control these is that, um, typically with the depth sensor, is they're just going to clip you effectively. They're going to say, look, there's a, there's a certain range that we function in. They also have range distances, meaning that a Tango device versus a HoloLens is typically tuned for different distances. It's important to know as an application developer or designer. Uh, Tango will go to about 12 feet. They typically have a clipping plane at a few feet in front of you. So if, when you're designing the experience, you shouldn't expect someone to be looking at something at the back of the room or right up on top of it, right? So you're developing for an envelope in which they can see things, in which the IR sensor is effective in that range. Um, and in using something like RGB, which is part of the visual inertial odometry system, or even used for our, our computer vision-based recognition algorithms, uh, again, what they're doing is typically reducing the image to a grayscale. They're looking at patterns of contrast, and there should be some density of features, right? Something like a, a perfectly white wall has no features on it. The same wall, if you began adding little speckles, and you ran that up to a very high density of speckles, it essentially turns black eventually. That's what I'm trying to depict here, is that at zero features, you can't see anything, and when the feature density crosses a certain useful threshold for the given distance, you then lose apparent features as well. So there's an envelope, whether it's for lighting, it's for the range that the person is using it, um, or it's for the feature density that you're using. Oh, my gray didn't render. What I was going to talk about here is really just making a distinction between human factors and machine factors, which is the way we often think about app design, right? App designers aren't thinking about, like, what's the underlying hardware? What's my camera doing? You typically don't have to. Even for AR, we've gotten good enough, you can see it, um, that you often don't have to put so much consideration into it. I think the thing to be aware of with 
the emerging technologies with Tango and HoloLens, is that you do have to be a little more cognizant of it. And again, sort of embodying these, this understanding in the design of your application and your user experience. So you have traditional user experience for this, and I'm not using UX terminology here, but really understanding how do you induce useful behavior, how do you get someone to focus on what the, you want them to look at, how do you get them to even initiate the experience properly? This is actually a big challenge when you're using some of these where you say, oh, I've got a, I've got a new app that's like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whatever, a tower defense, and you're going to have a castle and dragons and all this kind of stuff, and go and just execute it. But if they don't execute it in an area that's sufficient to hold the castle, it doesn't work. Or that there's no area for the, the little characters to run towards the castle, it doesn't work, right? So you have to think about, like, how do you, how do you communicate to them how to find a setting and design a setting that they're able to use, right? So this is basic. I'm not going to go into depth on this because I think it's something better for an app designer and UX people to address. Again, I'd love to inspire a conversation about this, but it's beyond my pay grade. Um, the other is really subject matter. Again, you just have to be attentive to it. We talked about the thresholds, the envelopes of what is supported, and finding an area and a subject that is, that is sort of feasible within that. Now, the other thing that I'm touching on here is really, again, as an app designer in AR, you can't be ignorant of the machine factors. And again, this is, like I said with our app, designing an app in a way that it's friendly to the resources available to the device. And this is really simple things like not running the depth sensor continuously, turning it on and off when it's useful. Our APIs within Smart Train give you an ability to toggle what we call reconstruction, but you can update the mesh, stop the updates, resume the updates, and just being aware that, look, you do that. Like, as you're designing the app, give yourself an opportunity to enable the user to create discrete areas of experience so that you can control use of the sensors in a way that is going to preserve your resources, whether it's, again, heating or memory consumption, power consumption, battery, all of that. What you'll see, I mean, if you haven't developed apps, it's, if you do something that really starts pressing the device too hard, what it does is it starts down clocking, and that means it lowers the frame rate, it reduces the experience. So some of your responsibility is going to be managing that. So let me get into how we model the environment. And this is really more of a discussion or brings in Smart Terrain. Um, what Smart Terrain does is to take the output from a Tango or a HoloLens again, we take that mesh, we process it, and we basically turn it into a useful representation of the environment. We actually take it and we, we segment it so that we understand where all of your surfaces are, we understand when there are things sitting on top of the surface, right? And we actually reconstruct those independently. And we also understand when there are known objects in that environment. So we're giving you geometry, we're giving you the contour, we're giving you order and structure of the environment, and we're also giving you semantics, as we call them. We give you an understanding of the things you know or that you recognize within the environment. So this makes, Smart Train is, is dynamic meaning that it's, it starts automatically. You don't have to scan something, store it, come back to it, and then use it. What you see with some of the technology out there now is that if you wanted to create an experience in this room, you'd have to walk all around the room, whatever area you wanted to use. Let's say you wanted to put it here. You'd have to scan it beforehand, stop, and then start the app to use that. What, ours, what Smart Train does is it really starts automatically, and it uses what's available to it immediately. So as soon as the scanning starts, we start constructing your environment. So you can build experiences that don't presume that the user has to go and prepare everything beforehand. It's structured in the sense that we are providing you a logical representation of the scene. We're segmenting this plane from the floor plane from the wall plane, so they're all handled independently. They all have an ID that you can use so that you can distinguish them, and you can use them you know, as a, a surface unto itself. And also we, under, we allow you to do things like querying. We can say, find, you can say, find me a, a, an area of a given size or within a given minimum maximum or over a given size. And also find me areas that are vertical versus horizontal, right? Which is, sounds very basic, but it's very useful. And the third thing again is we segment the areas from themselves. So each, whether it's the floor, the walls, or the objects, are all independent, isolated objects within your environment or within your scene graph. Um, and that enables you to really address them independently. So then when I talk about logic, uh, this is what's somewhat new, is that we've come in with what we call an environmental scene graph. And this is very new, but it's a very powerful 
sort of metaphor for this. So a scene graph is something used in 3D programming that really gives you kind of a hierarchical representation of the scene. It tells you when something is the child of something else. Let's say you have a character that has a weapon in his hand or a torch, that the torch is a child of the character. It enables you to create hierarchical relationships um, within the scene. And that's what we're providing. Essentially, dynamically, as you construct your environment, we're giving you an understanding of not only the spatial relationship among things, but really the hierarchical significance among things. Knowing that this cup is a child of the tabletop, because it's on the tabletop. That kind of idea. And this is what it looks like in Unity. So we have Smart Terrain with Tango will be coming out this fall. This isn't available yet. But this is a view of, what, of the Unity scene graph. Right? You've probably seen this if you've worked in Unity. Is really, it's the understanding that there's sort of a parent of the scene and the contents of the scene are contained in that and that the contents of the scene have other hierarchical relationships with things that utilize them, have a dependency on them, or have some other relationship, whether spatially or, or through some other logical association. So once you have that, is it enables you to start utilizing what had traditionally been a machine factor as now something closer to a human factor. You can now apply reasoning, right, inferential reasoning, programmatic reasoning, to this being that you have a knowledge of really the structure of the scene graph as a kind of data structure, something you can navigate, something that you can make inferences about, knowing that, let's say, again, the cup is on the tabletop. If I know the tabletop and I want everything associated with the table to be affected, let's say that this wasn't part of the scene originally. I didn't know about this originally, but it's been placed here. This now becomes a child, and if I want to affect the tabletop, let's say to turn it over, then I can say, well, the tabletop and all of its children should be affected by the same force or dynamic. Therefore, when the tabletop turns over, the cup should turn over, and it should fall with it. Right. And so that's very simple, but again, it enables you to make um, sort of a, a programmatic assumption about how something should behave without knowing about it beforehand, to inference, to reason about something. And then we talk about semantics. So hierarchy and structure give you an ability to apply programmatic reasoning to make inferencing, to make reasonable assumptions about things. Uh, semantics are, again, knowing the significance of something. Um, formally, you know, semantics is, is the meaning of something, the significance of something within a given context. So what's interesting is it not only tells you what's in the scene, but it enables you to give it a significance, right? So if I, when you saw the game originally, that card, which is just an image of a fissure, actually executes a behavior in the scene, and that becomes a hazard, and it has to be addressed by the behavior of the application. So when you see that, we, we have a particle emitter, right? Um, but what it means is that when we're navigating the drone, we can, can treat the position of the fissure as a significant obstacle in the scene. We can actually apply physics to it. We can pr create a boundary. We can have some effect on another element in the scene really based on our semantic understanding of the role and significance of the fissure card. The other big area is, and we didn't actually realize this originally until we started working with it, is something as basic as, as a semantic understanding. Knowing what I'm looking at gives me a knowledge of the intrinsics of this thing. Um, and it's kind of a subtle problem until you start thinking about it, is if I'm just constructing this environment, I've given it to somebody I don't know, they're in a setting I've never seen before, I don't know what they're gonna do with it, I really don't have any sense of the basic space or directionality of something. I don't know really what's the front or the back of the setting. Some settings it doesn't matter, but here, I know I have a wall here, I have a user here, and I would like to, let's say, orient the experience so that it's facing that way, right? I want things to run that way. This is where something like a known object is, is useful, because what we have here is the card has a top and a bottom, right? And when we lay this out, it actually enables us to instill a direction in the environment. When I put this here, knowing that's the bottom of the card, I can direct activity, I can direct the characters of the app, um, in a given direction, really knowing where this is placed, right? And I also know the boundaries of this. So what enables me having directionality and having some knowledge of the intrinsic properties of, of an object that I recognize enables me to design 
app logic that actually takes that into account, and it makes it easier to create applications. One of the things we've seen, like with HoloLens, is people are using our stuff heavily just for the fact that it enables them to put content into the world at a known place with a known direction. And it's really basic, it's, it's really fundamental, but it's a very powerful capability that's provided by using targets within a scene graph. So I think they're gonna kick us out, but this is the basic life cycle of a smart train app. Really what's happening is that it's updating itself, it's, it's extracting features from the environment, it's giving you planes, it's giving you props. It's a loop, right? You're getting callbacks, this is really the Unity view, and you have an ability to start it and stop it. And as that's happening, it's creating this scene graph. So it's giving you a view of all of your surfaces, their size, their position, their orientation, any of the props on the surfaces, and then any known objects that you've seen in there. Again, the targets, objects that you've seen, it's updating that on a frame-by-frame -frame basis very rapidly. And then what we enable you to do through our APIs is essentially filter the output. So you're not getting a raw output of the environment. This is, again, what makes this useful, is that if you just scan the environment, you're going to get a, try this sometimes, you're going to get just a mess of different mesh and planes and everything. You don't even know, it's very difficult to work with. So, what we enable you to do is say, look, I just want the wall. I don't want everything else. And actually, I just want the wall if it's bigger than a certain size. I want the primary wall in the environment. So don't give me a lot of small planes. Just give me the biggest plane you can find. And it's a way of sort of applying what's known as scene understanding, is that you can essentially filter the output coming from Smart Train in a way that you're only getting surfaces that are useful to you. Um, and also, even after you've constructed something, to make a query against it. So you've done the room, you've gone through it, and you say, you know what, I still need, I still need a smaller plane that's oriented, let's say, a certain distance above the floor. I'm looking for maybe a tabletop or, 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 or a chair or something. So let me make a query for that. I need something at a given distance and a given size. Just return that, and that's what I want to use. So again, this is one of the principles that, or the, one of the capabilities that enables you to create a dynamic environment using Smart Terrain. And then again, we have just basic state monitoring, which is coming from um, our own targets. That's it. So, hopefully we have time for questions. You're gonna, okay, all right, thank you everybody.